Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new, welcome. My name is Adelina and I make videos about living in my tiny house on wheels and living a more intentional life. We are not in the tiny house today. Things are getting a little chaotic in there with the prep for the move. And it is a glorious day today. It's 23 degrees Celsius here on the Vancouver Islands. And after sitting at my desk all day, I had to get out. But the thing I want to talk about today is um, actually something that I think is not talked about enough. I recently watched a video by one of my favorite YouTubers, Stacy at Casaduro. Now, <laughs> I love Stacy, not just because she's Portuguese like I am, and her parents were immigrants from Portugal like mine were, but also just because of how uh, down to earth and real she is. And her video today, I, I literally sat there nodding the whole time because it was so insightful and so thought provoking that it made me, uh, well, reach out to her to ask her if it was okay if I uh, basically duetted her video. Just talked about it, talked about those topics. I will link her video down below. If you haven't already, if you don't already follow her, I highly recommend that you do because she uh, really has a different perspective on the tiny house lifestyle, on life in general. Uh, because, well, she's a very different generation than I am. Uh, she's more my kids' generation. And while we share uh, so many uh, of the same values, uh, I think that each generation comes to things from their own unique perspective. But so well worth subscribing and binge watching her videos. Anyways, the video that I want to talk about today is basically about, oh, I don't have this oriented properly. Hold on. That's better. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forgot all the basic rules of uh, videoing for YouTube. Always do landscape. Anyways, the video that I want to talk about is her video about how the whole tiny house movement has been, is, has been, um, well, not the whole tiny house movement, but so much of the tiny house movement has been basically uh, hijacked by this notion, this idyllic sort of notion that um, in order to do tiny house life right, it has to involve moving to the middle of nowhere, being off grid, having solar panels, uh, a homestead, living off the land, growing all your own food, all of those things. And while I certainly think that there are a lot of people that come to the tiny house lifestyle uh, with, you know, that uh, belief or that desire in their minds, absolutely. The desire to get away from the rat race, the desire to get away from large cities and crowds of people to become more self-sufficient. What it does is it makes people feel that if that's not what they want, then they're either not doing the tiny house lifestyle right or uh, they don't belong in a tiny house. I feel like that's a shame because it, dis it could discourage people who that's not what they want. They just want to have a smaller space to clean. They just want to have a less expensive way to live. Um, and, and so, but that's not what they're seeing so often on social media, on YouTube, and uh, on TikTok, and Instagram, and all of those other platforms. Um, and I'm, when I was watching her video, I actually had to stop the video for a second and go, oh my God, am I partially responsible for that? Am I, have I become um, part of that problem? Let me explain what I mean. What I mean is, 
do I idealize this lifestyle so much that um, it's no longer realistic and becomes almost elitist? I hope I don't. I've always strived on this channel to show life in a very realistic way, um, the successes, the challenges, um, so that everybody sees that there's no such thing as perfect and that's okay. Um, but, you know, it made me double think that to sort of give myself a check to see if that's what I was doing um, because I don't want that to be the case. So she makes a really good point in that uh, when she says, talks about her parents uh, as immigrants having come to this country so that their family, their kids, the next generation wouldn't have to work as hard to survive every day as, you know, their parents did. And that was very much my family as well. My, my parents both came, were both the oldest of very large families in rural Portugal. Uh, with farms and animals and every day was so much work and one of the goals for them to make this incredible trek across the world to come to Canada was so that we didn't have to struggle like that so that we could have a, an easier life with more comforts and what I really want to avoid is making this lifestyle seem like Everybody has to go back to that. Because if we're not careful, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, and while I love the idea of planting a garden and growing some of my own vegetables, I certainly at some point would like to have some solar panels uh, around or on top of my house. My goal at this point in my life in particular is not to be... Uh, totally off-grid in the middle of nowhere. Uh, she makes a very good point, Stacy does, in her video where she, she says that she believes that the goal in life should be or at least include being part of a community. And I totally agree with that because I think human beings by nature are um, pack animals, communal animals to some extent. Even those of us who are introverts are still, do still need a sense of community and our um, pack around us, our family, whether it's blood or adopted. And I, I just find it interesting because I do get comments and questions uh, quite often on my channel asking, um, do I have solar? Am I off grid? You know, will I buy property of my own? Will I homestead? Uh, all of those things. As if to say, and, and it's probably not intended, but it feels like what they're saying is um, until I get to that place, I'm not quite there yet. Her video, her discussion, just really had me thinking about how uh, so many things in life for us uh, we idealize. It's not good enough to uh, buy a van and fit it out. You have to live in your van full time. Uh, you have to live the van life and you're not doing it right if there's not constant photos of you laying on your bed with the, uh, the shot you know, looking out along your legs through your feet to some beautiful ocean view or mountain view. Um, if you are parked in the Walmart parking lot, well, you're not quite doing van life right. Which again, is ridiculous. Uh, because people go into that lifestyle for many different reasons. Not all of them want to travel, not all of them can travel. And it's the same with the tiny house on wheels. Uh, it's People decide to live a smaller lifestyle, to have a smaller living space for many different reasons. Some of which are out of necessity and some of which are uh, out of choice.
and not everybody has the choice and therefore not everybody has the luxury of being able to live this imaginary idyllic lifestyle. Living in a tiny house on wheels is awesome. So is living in a great big house. So is living in a van, a schoolie. So is living in a cute little apartment. Living an intentional life is what I think the point is. Um, and as much as possible, how do I put it? As much as possible creating your life to match your values and your dreams. But not all of us have that luxury. And so sometimes when I get a comment from a viewer that says, you know, you know, unfortunately I'm not living in a tiny house, I've got an apartment or I've got a, you know, a small suite or a house. I don't think that is unfortunate at all as long as you've made it your own and as long as it feels like home and sanctuary and it's your safe place to land, there's nothing wrong with that. I made a lot of sacrifices to have the lifestyle that I have now, uh, all of which were intentional, but I came to them sometimes out of necessity because of events that happened in my life. Um, and I'm very fortunate, again, that my parents moved from a world where existence was difficult to bring me to a country where existence is easy in relation to that for most of us so that I could choose <laughs> to then make my existence difficult again by, you know, moving into a tiny house, um, maybe at some point buying some land, homesteading a bit, uh, planting a garden. It's because of the sacrifice and hard work of the generation before mine that has allowed me the luxury to give up some of this comfort in search of um, discomfort in self-sufficiency, if that makes sense. But that is not a requirement to live a good life. Uh, there's very little, I think, that is required to live a good life. You know, once you've taken care of the shelter, food, water, safety. Um, and so those are the necessities. And you have enough of the luxuries, excess of those things, then happiness is possible. And uh, focusing on this idyllic, imaginary lifestyle and comparing it to where you have, to what you have now is a recipe for um, unhappiness or dissatisfaction. And I think this world has enough of that. And I think you would all agree with me. And so we have to find a way to stop idealizing things, uh, especially if they're not your dream. Now, if you've always dreamt about a homestead, oof, look at my hair, it's humid. Uh, and a farm or you know those things then and being off grid well then then that's your dream and you should definitely do everything you can to pursue it but if you haven't you're not doing something wrong because you don't you don't want that so when Stacy talks about her definition of simple living uh, I thought that was also very interesting because I talk a lot on my channel about living an intentional life. And um, I think we're talking about the same thing. And by that I mean what we're talking about is uh, slowing down enough to see what's right in front of you, appreciate what you have, and um, take a step back from being part of the herd in this, uh, you know, consumeristic world that we live in. She mentions the, the hustle culture 
that we live in. And that is so true. And that is one of the reasons that I wanted to move into a tiny house so that hopefully it would give me the ability to maybe retire a little bit early or work part time. Um, but also it would provide all of these amazing opportunities, these opportunities to get outside and appreciate what's right in front of me, what's right here. This doesn't require me living in the middle of nowhere. This doesn't require me moving to a different country. This doesn't require me to sacrifice everything that I have to appreciate. It's right here. And I certainly lived enough of my life always um, thinking about when. When I did do this, then this will happen. When I have this, then that will happen. Uh, and I miss the opportunities, I think, sometimes, to just appreciate all the things that were already there. So intentional living for me is that. It's, uh, it's slow living, appreciating what I have, um, not working just to be busy, but with a goal in mind, but not putting off joy and uh, fun and adventure until a, a, a time in the future, retirement. And I'm going to tell you a little story about how I learned that lesson and uh, why I am the way I am in so many ways. So as I mentioned earlier, my parents are immigrants, were immigrants from Portugal. They both grew up in the same little town um, in the uh, Azores, the islands, just off the coast of the mainland of Portugal. And um, when my dad came to Canada, he worked really, really hard. He didn't have an education. He had left school very young in order to work the family farm because his dad had died when he was young and he was the oldest, the oldest male in his family. And when he came to Canada and finally settled up in the Northwest Territories working for Cominco Mines as a heavy equipment operator uh, and he sent for us because I'm four, I was four when I came to Canada and I'm the youngest of our family. I remember my dad doing two things <laughs> when I was a kid. He was either working shift work or he was sleeping because he was working shift work. And he took every overtime shift he could get. We uh, did not take holidays, we did camp. He liked to fish, he had a little boat, a little rowboat. But he saved and he worked. He sent money home to my mom's family, my mom's mom, and her brothers and sisters, and he sent home money home to his mother and siblings. And I do remember him talking really often about what he was going to do when he retired. He was going to buy a motorhome and a boat, uh, a motorboat, like a bigger boat, that he was going to pull behind the motorhome. And my parents were going to tour Canada, the coastlines, uh, even down into the U.S. And he was going to fish and they were going to travel that way. That was his dream. That's all he wanted to do. That's all he talked about doing. We took two holidays that I remember as a kid. Uh, one when I think I was about 10 or 11, we, maybe about 9 or 10, we went to Portugal because my mom's mom was sick at the time. Uh, she passed about you know, less than a year later. And so we, the whole family went to visit her. And the second trip we took, um, I think I was 13 and my dad was already sick. My dad got MS in his mid forties. And within five years, within a very short period of time, actually, he was walking with a cane and then within five years, he was in a wheelchair and he could not walk it very much at all, uh, even with a cane. 
And then it progressed. He eventually ended up 100% in the wheelchair, needing help to get in and out of bed, needing help to uh, toilet, to bathe, all of those things. And my mom and I took care of him. Um, my mom started working at the mine, the local mine. She would work the graveyard shift as a custodian. I would run home from school every day so I could get there in time to kiss her goodbye because the Kaminko mine would send a bus out at every, for every shift and it would go through the town because it was a mining town and pick up and drop off workers. And so she would catch that bus, I think at 4.30, I don't really remember, but I would run home from school in order to kiss her goodbye. And then I would take care of my dad. I would make dinner, I would take care of him, make sure he got into bed okay. My mom would call about 10.30ish to say goodnight. <laughs> then I would make a cup of tea for her. My dad was already sleeping in the, the spare bedroom. Um, he had a hospital bed. And so my mom had the master bedroom and I would make her a cup of tea, put it by her bedside table, on her bedside table with a little plate on it. I don't know why I thought it would keep it warm. And I would turn on her bedside lamp and fold down the covers so her bed was ready for her because she got off at, uh, she got home around one in the morning. And that was our routine. And so, a lot of you have heard me talk about my mom and how close we were. You know, it all stems from uh, how much time we spent together in the kitchen cooking, but also moments like this. But what I learned from this, my dad ended up passing away uh, when he was 65. He had been in the hospital in long-term care for years and years at that point. We had already moved to Toronto um, because that second trip that we took was to Toronto, that second holiday we took as a family to go and see a specialist for his MS. We ended up moving there to stay with family. My mom eventually got a job at the hospital he was in as a custodian so she could visit with him before and after her shift and on her breaks. And what I learned from all of that was, you know, you can't put everything off until your retirement. You have to live your life as you go along because there's no such thing as a guarantee. My dad never got his dream retirement. My dad never got to do all of the things he dreamed about doing. He could have, but he chose not to. Uh, he chose to put those things off for good reasons. I'm not criticizing, obviously. But here's what I learned. I learned that two things. First of all, you shouldn't put things off because tomorrow's never guaranteed and certainly years down the road isn't. And the second thing I learned was you do have to save for the future because if my father hadn't saved, I don't know how our family would have managed. You know, Kaminko, he did have a pension um, and my mom did get a survivor benefit from his pension. But because he had saved so much, our family was okay. So there's two lessons there, right? Save for the future, but also live for today. You can't just do one, in my opinion. It should be a combination of the two in order to live a rich and intentional life. And so one of the reasons for me living the tiny house lifestyle is to make sure that I'm not putting off every one of my dreams until, the re until retirement, just in case, but also to plan for that time so that it is also an abundant uh, and fun time. Anyways, guys, um, I am glad that I finally got to share that story about my dad. It's kind of, um, you know, very close to my heart, obviously. Yeah.
anyways i hope you guys are doing well i hope you're staying safe oh just love this remember in a world where you can be anything be kind i love you and i'll see you next time